does it take to get a more in-depth look into the week's top local news stories? The Debrief brings you inside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our reporters every week, right here, right now. The Debrief. Welcome into The Debrief. I'm your host, Adam Cooperstein, in for David Ushery. If you have yet to contract COVID, you are part of a shrinking minority. The CDC says more than 60% of Americans have had COVID at least once. Other experts believe that number is more than 75%. So if you haven't gotten it, are you just lucky? Or is there something about your genetics that's actually protecting you? Today on The Debrief, we're going to talk to two researchers working to answer those very questions. And we're going to chat with a nurse who's enrolled in a study about this because she was exposed to multiple sick patients at the height of the pandemic here in the city and yet never caught the virus herself. Neville Sanjana from the New York Genome Center and NYU is one of the people studying why some people are more likely to get infected with COVID-19 and some people seem to be less likely or why some people may have a more serious case of COVID-19 and others don't. Neville, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and this work that you're doing. First question is, do you believe there's an explanation for why two people can be in the same exact space, share a space, one has COVID and the other one never gets it? A absolutely. I, th I think there's many different reasons why that could be. It could be as simple as one person, you know, takes a lot more precautions than the other person. There can be environmental reasons. Something that we're very interested in, I think many people are interested in, is whether there can be genetic differences between different people that modulate their susceptibility to COVID or to the flu. And when, and you've studied this now for a while, from the results you've already brought in, do you have some indication about how genetics plays a role in protecting some people differently from coronavirus than others? A absolutely. So, you know, one thing that we did is we took a very systematic approach we tried to look at every single gene in the human genome and say, what happens, which, how important are each of these genes to um, susceptibility to COVID? And we did this using human lung cells that we can actually grow in the lab. And so what we get out of this is kind of a rank ordered list. And we know that there's some genes that really don't matter that much, but there are other genes that are incredibly important, like the receptor on a lung cell that the virus uses to enter the cell. Because it seems like we're gonna be living with this virus for a long time, it's pretty informative. This could be really important and useful information. How could the data from this study actually help us in the future? One way that um, we were very excited about when we first got this, this kind of um, this, this, uh, gene list was to say, okay, so if we know which genes are particularly important for the virus to get into cells, maybe this could be a way that could inform development of future therapeutics. So we know about some things like um, neutralizing antibodies that have been used or drugs um, that target some of the viral genes that inhibit the virus's ability to replicate. But what about the host side? You know, it takes two to tango, right? It's the virus doesn't live freely by itself. It needs a host. And so one thing you might imagine is similar to the work that's been done with, say, HIV, where there's a cocktail of multiple drugs that's now used to keep HIV in check, you know, compared to decades ago when it was kind of a death sentence. You might imagine that we could develop drugs that inhibit some of those key human genes, just even temporarily as a prophylactic, and would then be able to keep the virus in check and be more powerful than just a single drug alone. So making a combination. What would you say to someone who says, uh, you know, I, I, my kids all had COVID and I took care of my children and I was making sure that they were OK for a week and I never tested positive. Does that mean that there's something special about me that protects me from this virus? Uh, compared to kids, you know, we know a lot more about uh, how to keep ourselves safe from the virus. Um, you know, certainly what the question that you're saying is how can two individuals that are related, you know, um, a parent and, and kids, how can they differ? Well, you know, through the gener even in one generation, we know that half of our genetic contribution comes from mom and half comes from dad. And so even in that single household, single generation, there can be pretty significant differences on the genetic side, right, that lead to different susceptibilities. 
when you talk about susceptibility, of course, there's contracting the virus, but then there's also how you react to the illness, which is the COVID-19 part of it all. Um, and we know about health factors that can make somebody more susceptible to severe illness or less susceptible, but there's more to it than just uh, being immunocompromised is what you're saying. A absolutely. I mean, so some of the health factors, I think that you're talking about are things like obesity, diabetes. We know that there's um, increased age. There's uh, things that associate with more severe COVID, uh, not being vaccinated, for instance. Um, so there's a wide variety of factors beyond genetics, obviously, that are that are controlling this. The virus is also changing, right? That some of the symptoms that were hallmarks early on in 2020, early 2021, um, you know, losing a sense of smell, losing a sense of taste, are now just rarer. We don't see them as often. And part of this is that the virus is changing. There's the viral side. There's also the host side. More of us are, are uh, immunized. Um, and this will continue to evolve. This arms race will continue to, to go on. It will continue to change, especially as our vaccines um, are now made to the new strains. That's a likely change that will happen. We'll see in the next uh, year or so. I think one really nice thing is that it seems to be becoming a little bit less uh, virulent. We're also learning more about how to treat this illness, keeping people out of the hospital. Yeah, you see that now, even as we have a spike in cases nationwide and here in the tri-state, people are still more willing to live their life because they know that they can treat it and they can survive it. And, uh, and it might be a disruption to your daily life, but it's not necessarily going to lead to the same health concerns as before. That's right. That's that that <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, we still have to be, I think, mindful of things. There's a lot of work that's going on uh, through NIH and other uh, funders of of um, biomedical research with looking at things like long COVID. Um, you know, we still want to know are there folks that are going to have long term effects because so many of us have had COVID already. Um, it's not to say you know that it's just all uh, uh, you know we're we're kind of in the clear right now. But I think um, certainly we're in a much better place in terms of treatments, in terms of vaccines than where we were before. Um, and going forward, I think things are, are looking better and better. Let's welcome in Dr. Evangelos Andreakos, an immunologist in Athens and also a collaborator on this Rockefeller University study. Dr. Andreakos, thank you so much for joining us. What do you hope to learn by studying a potential genetic resistance to the coronavirus? Thank you for inviting me. So we aim to understand how the virus really enters into cells and how it, what it requires to replicate and spread. Uh, so we hope by identifying very, very basic aspects of resistance that we will be able to define pathways that we didn't know before and therefore define new targets for therapeutic intervention. How difficult is it when you're studying people in a two-year pandemic without a real controlled environment for the study? It's very difficult to really know who's resistor or who's resistant to infection or who isn't. So the first thing I say to people, because uh, all this effort that we're doing took uh, big media attention in various different countries, including mine, is that most likely you are not uh, someone resistant to the infection but it's just coincidental that at the time that you got exposed, uh, you did not get exposed with sufficient virus load. There were other reasons for which uh, momentarily at that specific moment you were resistant. Maybe you had uh, something else that could activate uh, a resistant mechanism or temporarily resistant mechanism and so on. So we're really looking at genetic resistance ourselves because there are other reasons for which someone can be temporarily, I'm saying again the word temporarily resistant with the development of more infectious variants, like the Omicron variants, and we realized that many of these people got infected. So in reality, they thought they were resistant. Uh, they filled many of the criteria of our, or uh, fully filled the criteria of the initial criteria of our study, but actually they got infected at the third or fourth wave. So we're talking about, uh, we think that will be a very limited, rare population. Uh, but we still think it is very important to identify that because the information it can give us uh, uh, is likely to be very novel and very unexpected. 
Is there a way to verify that someone truly has never contracted the coronavirus because it's possible they had an asymptomatic case and just didn't get a test and never knew they had contracted it? So one thing that someone can look is the presence of antibodies against the virus. So although he didn't have a positive test, a positive molecular test, and a positive rapid test, he may have developed uh, antibodies against the virus. And we can uh, discriminate this from the antibodies vaccination induces, so we can tell. And then we can also look at it uh, with more deep technologies. Uh, we can look at the at the what we call the cellular response, the T cell response is the scientific word. And we can see there, as with the antibodies, if someone has uh, been exposed and his cells, his T cells that are specific to the virus, if they have expanded or not in the organism. So you can distinguish between antibodies from contracting the virus in the past and antibodies from the vaccine because so many people in America have now been vaccinated. Exactly. We can distinguish that. How long do you think it'll take before you can offer any sort of, uh, you know, data or results of the study? Uh, although we have made some progress, we think at least a year, uh, but maybe two years would be more safe <laughs> because it's not just identified areas in the DNA that are associated or fit, but we want also to get uh, uh, functional evidence, so experimental data that indeed this is a key uh, uh, area of the DNA resulting in a key biological mechanism. So that will take a bit also more time. And what we are finding out, and which complicates our study, is that people that we think are candidates, when we do another round of checking whether they, have, they are still uh, not infected, we are often disappointed. So these people, many of our people, you know, now that we thought were part of the study are not. So we're still recruiting, we're still looking for these individuals. That's a good way to rule somebody out of the study, right? You, you, they become part of the study, then they contract the virus. It's obvious <laughs> that they don't have resistance. Exactly. But still, the genetic information that we have for them, the, the genome, is important because it can be used as a, as a very useful control for the, for the other individuals that we're trying to assess. Joining us now on The Debrief is Bevan Strickland. Bevan, is a nurse who came here to New York City at the height of the pandemic in April of 2020 to help out. And she's also part of the Rockefeller University study to see if some people have some sort of genetic resistance to the coronavirus. Bevan, thank you so much for the time. So you've been on the front lines. You were here at the epicenter. You were at Mount Sinai in Queens, and you've never contracted COVID. Here we are two years, more than two years after the start. When did you first think, well, that's curious that that I'm not contracting this very transmissible virus. I, I just believed I would get it. I believed I'd probably get it and not be symptomatic or have a, I mean, I'm not young, but I, I'm healthy, I'm active. I thought I'll probably, you know, get it and have a mild case if anything. That's, and I fully expected when I left there, when they were going to do antibodies and test us and fully expected to either test positive or at least have positive antibodies by the time I left. And when I left six weeks later, nothing, absolutely nothing and definitely no symptoms. So, but there were lots of other nurses, ones who were there from the beginning, who live and work there, um, who were dealing with it before they knew it was COVID when they were having large numbers of uh, nursing home patients come through with pneumonia. Uh, and there's, there was a few that didn't get it. So it's, it's, I don't think it's a rare thing that there were a lot of people that didn't get it. You know, um, I think it's just, Obviously, it's important to study it, um, but I guess it's easier to study people who had really direct, blatant exposure, you know, kind of measurable exposure. You know what I mean? Um, I also was exposed when one of my twins got got COVID and his brother and I didn't get it. So it's admirable what you did. You put yourself at risk trying to comfort the sickest of COVID patients. And then you go back to North Carolina and it's not like you're living in a bubble. And now here we are two years later and you've still not contracted COVID. Still haven't had it. And um, I also, I don't know if it you know, says anything, but um, you know, I, I, I haven't had any reaction to the vaccine either. Um, I've been double vaccinated and boosted with Pfizer and no symptoms other than a sore arm. Um, my twin who did get COVID, went, once he was able to get vaccinated, um, 
he actually was symptomatic with the vaccine. His twin brother, nothing. So I don't know. So you thought there's something fishy about this. And you I, I, I joked that there, maybe there's like a protein that, you know, viruses. I, I do, I can say that I haven't been one to ever, and I feel like my parents as well are like this, but um, I feel like I've never had the flu that I'm aware of. I feel like nothing has ever been a respiratory issue for, you know, in my life. Um, I've never had like bronchitis or these, I don't have any seasonal allergies. Um, maybe there's some kind of component that component that relates to that. I don't know. You're also not very superstitious because you're out talking about the fact that you haven't gotten COVID. And it could be it could be tomorrow. You, I mean, that's a possibility. Could Everybody works jokes about that. They're like, Bevan, you're going to get COVID. You're going to get COVID. And I was like, I, I'm fine with getting COVID. I, you know, it almost got to the point where you start to feel left out. <laughs> you're like, I feel like I should get it just to say I've had COVID and not to be symptomatic or sick, you know, especially when this last wave, when you saw that people were not getting as sick, it was, it was nice. But you also still take this very seriously. You've been vaccinated. Very seriously. You protected yourself. Uh, did you get a booster as well or just yes. the two shots? Triple, booster. Double, double vaccinated and then the, the booster. Yep. Okay. And so now how did you decide you wanted to become part of the study? Well, I, I many times I had thought, in fact, even while I was still in New York and I found out I had no antibodies, I was talking to my friend, Eric. He, he also had no antibodies. I mean, we just couldn't believe it. And I said, I hope this will bring about a lot of research to figure out why some people got it and why some people didn't and why some people got so sick other than maybe obvious stuff like comorbidities. I can't remember if I was Googling or if it was just NPR. Um, but I heard about it. I looked at their website. I saw what their kind of initiative was, what they were, what their goal was, uh, doing a long-term study, kind of very inclusive of, you know, very thorough. And so I reached out to them and they got, I think it was, a, took a few weeks, but then they got back to me and the, one of the physicians did an interview and about my exposure and the nature of the te the research. And so I was really happy. As a participant in the Rockefeller study, what did they ask of you? They sent me a kit through FedEx. I swabbed, you know, my saliva and sent it back and that's it. Very simple. And when do you expect to hear what the results of the study are? Well, that's what's kind of disappointing. They kind of, we had to watch a video, you know, information about it and we won't get any results. So it'll basically be when this, when the research is done. Um, I think unless they had something happen where they found some direct, you know, link on people's DNA that it was just so clear cut and definitive, maybe then we might hear something or maybe they might contact individuals and say, we want to have blood typing done. I don't know. Other than that, we're not expected. They told us not to expect to get results. How many times have you been tested for COVID? Uh, probably close to a dozen times I've tested. Just what I, I would say three of the times was when I thought I had direct exposure, like when my son um, had it. Um, and then I tested again like a week after. But a lot of times I did it just because I thought when everybody was getting it, like I, I might have it. I might have it, you know. Um, and that was when we were getting tests easily. And then all of a sudden we hit a point where we couldn't get tests easily. So and every time, uh, negative, yeah. negative, negative. Every time. Bevan, I hope you stay COVID free. Thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. And a big thanks to all of you for joining our conversation. And thanks to our production team, Ben Berkowitz, Melissa Mack, and Kiki Interasuan. We're going to see you next time right here on The Debrief. Uh -huh.